Good to see everybody here uh, and having a beautiful Lord's Day in which to worship together and continue our thoughts about um, living a godly life in a toxic world because we do live in a world that's toxic to our faith, but we need to live in a godly way nevertheless. What do you think that most non-believers think of when they hear the word Christian? What kind of image do you think comes to their mind? What kind of thoughts do they think? Do they think a follower of Jesus? Do they think someone who is committed to God? Do they think of a person who strives always to do what's right? Do they think of a person who is passionate about God and compassionate toward other people? Or do they think hypocrite? Do they think pretender? Do they think judgmental? Do they think someone who talks a good game, but whose life does not match it? Well, we don't know what people think, do we? But it ought to matter to us. It ought to matter to us what they think. Now, it doesn't matter in every respect, because you remember we talked last week about the fact that it doesn't matter to us that non-believers don't know who we are. It doesn't matter to us that they don't recognize that we are actually children of God, that we are actually God's holy people, that we are actually his temple, and all those other things that Peter said earlier in 1 Peter chapter 2. They may not recognize that, but that's, that's okay. We can live with that. We follow one who was rejected and despised, and yet who Peter says was the cornerstone of God's temple, the cornerstone of God's whole system, the whole cornerstone of everything that God wanted to do in this world is Jesus Christ. And because we follow him, then we realize that people are naturally going to un misunderstand who we are. And that's okay. We can live with that. We don't worry about it. Let them think what they will. We know who we are, and we know whose we are. But on the other hand, we do have to care about the impression that our lives make on other people, especially on non-believers. We have to care about that. We have to be cognizant of that every day that we live, that we are making an impression. Peter reminds us over and over in this letter that we are, as he puts it, aliens and exiles, as he says in verse 11, because we are sojourners in this world. We are temporarily here. We are on our way somewhere else, and we are not in our true home. Then we need to keep our conduct honorable among the Gentiles. Now, notice here that his, his word Gentile is kind of a synonym for non-believer. He doesn't mean it in the ethnic sense, but he means it in the sense of people of God as opposed to those who are not people of God in the way that Israel spoke of the Gentiles. So we have to be concerned about what Gentiles in that sense think about us. Christians' conduct is noticed by non-believers, and we want to be sure that we give the best possible impression because, let's face it, people are going to judge our Savior by what they see in us. And we might say, well, they shouldn't do that, but they do, and they're going to. And so we have to be aware uh, always of our conduct, not because our conduct can save them, but because our conduct can turn them away. Our conduct can cause them to not want to hear what we have to say about Jesus Christ. So we are to keep our conduct honorable, Peter, Peter says, so that when they speak evil against us, they will see our good deeds and glorify God. Now, I want you to notice what he says, so that when they speak evil against you, not if, it is not an if, it is a given in this world, that if you follow Christ closely, people are going to speak evil against you. Not everybody, but some people will. It's going to happen. If it's never happened, then you might wonder, you know, well, am I walking closely enough with the Lord? Because it is going to happen. Paul said that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And Peter is writing to believers who are sojourners and exiles and experiencing persecution. 
And he says, not if they speak evil against you, but when they speak evil against you. So that when they do, and it's going to happen, that they will find themselves speaking evil against people who are in reality good. And they'll be caused to glorify God. Now, Peter isn't the only one in the Bible who teaches us this about our conduct. You heard right at the beginning of the service, Matthew 5, 14 to 16. You're the light of the world, Jesus said. And nobody lights a lamp, puts it under a bushel. You are a city set on a hill. And yet the city is set on a hill because it can be seen and it is, can be observed. And beautiful cities could be admired because they were set on a hill. And he says, let your light so shine, therefore, among men that they may see your good deeds and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We're not doing the good that, they do, that we do so that others will look at us and think how wonderful we are. That doesn't matter. We want them to be able to look at us and see God. We want them to be able to look at us and see Christ in us. We want them to be able to look at us and know more about who God is because of what they see in us. Paul wrote to the Philippians and said, Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless, innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Now notice that Paul didn't say, if, you, if enough Christians live enough good lives, the world's going to be okay. He doesn't say that. He says it's a crooked and twisted generation. It was in his day. It is now. People's values. Outsiders making the always be gracious, he says. Let your speech be seasoned with salt so you know how to answer every person. Every person we speak to, we should stop and think about the impact of our words. We should stop and think is what I'm going to say going to help that person draw closer to God? Is what I'm going to say going to help that person come nearer to God, or is it going to create some kind of barrier? Paul, again, in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 12, says, Aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly toward outsiders and be dependent on nobody. Walk properly toward outsiders. There's a right way and a wrong way to do it. It's a good way and a bad way to live. We need to walk properly toward outsiders so that they will, that we will make the proper impression on them. So while we don't care what, that people don't recognize our standing with God, we do care that they see only the best in us, that they see Jesus in us. That's a Christian responsibility that all of us have. So how do we do it? How do we live so as to make that impression on unbelievers around us? And Peter, in the, these two verses, 11 and 12, specifies two requirements that I want us to notice today. Just two requirements. First of all, chapter 2 and verse 11, he says, abstain from the passions of the flesh. You know, if you're going to live the kind of life God wants you to live, there's some stuff you can't do. Okay. I hope that's not news to you. <laughs> but if it is, I'm sorry. But there's just some stuff you can't do. Uh, there are some things that simply are not done and should not be done by Christians. Now, the word abstain means avoid completely. It means don't do that ever. Just don't do that. What kind of things is he talking about? Well, he gives us some examples down in chapter 4 and verse 3. He says, the time is past for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. None of that should ever be a part of the life of a Christian. It goes on around us in the world all the time, but it's not to be something that we ever participate in. Abstain from it, Peter said. Abstain from all the passions of the flesh, he says, that war against our souls. 
Uh, he's echoing chapter 1 and verse 14 when he says, do not, uh, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. In other words, don't live the way that you used to live before you knew Christ. But he says, be holy instead. Now, I want you to notice why he says to abstain. Why does he say to abstain from the passions of the flesh? Sometimes people get the idea that, that the Bible is just full of stuff that you cannot do, all the thou shalt nots, because God just doesn't want anybody to have any fun. He just doesn't want anybody to enjoy. War is no joke. War is never good. War is never easy. No, war is never soft. War is always a harsh reality that has to be dealt with. And this terminology is not exaggerated when it's applied spiritually. We are engaged in a war for our souls. When you wake up every morning and you walk out of your house every day, you are engaging in a war whether you know it or not and that's the bad thing is sometimes we don't even think about it can you imagine being in a war and not knowing you were in one can you imagine wandering out into a conflict zone unarmed not even thinking about the battle not even looking for the enemy not preparing yourself not wearing armor not doing anything just roaming around out there that's what we do if we're not recognizing that we are engaged in a warfare against our souls. Listen to uh, what Paul wrote to the Galatians. But I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing what you would. See, the desires of the flesh are in opposition to what God desires for us, what the spirit that God has placed within us desires. And so those are, those are warring with each other. There's that pull every day. There are those decisions that we have to make to do right instead of do wrong. And then when it looks easier or when it looks more tempting to do that, which is wrong, that we just say, no, we're not going to do that. Well, what kind of stuff is he talking about? He goes ahead. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, Sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You see how serious this war is? We don't inherit the kingdom of God if we do those things. These passions that Peter is warning us against will keep us from doing the good that we need to do as disciples of Jesus. And those passions will push the good out of our lives and fill us with things that ought not to be there. And the end result is we will not enter the kingdom of God. We will be lost. You know, to a lot of people, that's new news. A lot of people didn't know that Christians... People who follow Jesus can lose what they have. And there are people who teach as doctrine that that's not possible. Read your Bible. Peter's writing to Christians. He's warning them about these things. Paul's writing to Christians when he says what he does, does in Galatians. If you do those things, you're not going to enter the kingdom. Read your Bible and see what it says. It says you'd better take this warfare seriously because these things wage war against your souls. No wonder Peter says to abstain from them. It's like telling someone to abstain from drinking poison. It will kill you. So abstain from the passions of the flesh. We want to live a good life before non-believers. Abstain from the passions of the flesh. Second thing he says in verse 12, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Keep your conduct honorable. So there's a negative, abstain from the passions, but then it has to be matched by the positive. Keep your conduct honorable. You know, we have a twofold way of proclaiming our faith, don't we? 
One is by the words that we speak, the message of the gospel, telling people that Jesus died for their sins, that he died for all of us, and that he rose from the dead, and that we can have eternal life through him. That's a message that has to be spoken. You can't just example that message. You have to speak that message. But the other way of telling that message is by living in a way that reflects your faith in what you believe. It's kind of like uh, matching, it's matching up how we live with what we say. It's kind of like putting the words and the music together to make a beautiful melody. I remember a number of years ago being in uh, St. Stephen's Plaza in Vienna. And we were, uh, had been walking back from a restaurant that we had been to. And all of a sudden you could hear the sweetest, sweetest refrains of somebody playing Amazing Grace on a saxophone. And, and it was just lovely. They, they were really skilled at it. It was really beautiful. And, and we were walking along, and the closer we got, you know, the more beautiful it got, and those familiar, uh, the familiar melody, Amazing Grace. But you know that melody wouldn't mean nearly what it does to us if we didn't know the words. Right? If you didn't know that that song was about God's amazing grace... It'd just be another pretty melody. But because we know what that song's about, because the words are with the music, it's unforgettable. It makes an impact on our lives. It's deeply moving, and we hear it at funerals all the time, and we sing it in worship all the time, and, and we find ourselves humming it and singing it. Why? Because the words have been put with the music. You have any idea the power of a godly life when the words and the music are matched up, when we are living for Jesus and letting that be seen and we're doing the honorable things that we ought to do in life, and as we do so, we're telling people why. That it's because of Jesus. We're putting the words and the music together. But it's not just so that unbelievers will respect and, and admire us, rather that they may see your good works and glorify God on the day of visitation. I noticed in the translation that Kent read from, it says at the judgment time. And that's, that's what day of visitation means in the Old Testament. It's the Old Testament language, the day of visitation, when God visits his people, whether he visits them in judgment to make things right for them or he visits them in judgment to punish them for their wrongs. The day of visitation is the day of judgment. So what is Peter thinking about here? How are these non-believers going to glorify God on the day of judgment because of what they see in us? Here's what I think he has in mind. I think he's saying that if we live in the way that he instructs, avoiding the passions of the flesh, maintaining good conduct and doing good things in life, and that word good can be translated beautiful, honorable, if we're doing beautiful, honorable, good things in life, some non-believers are going to change their minds. Some of them are going to change their mind. They're not all. But some of them will change their minds, not only about us, but about Christ. And then when the day of judgment comes, they'll be glorifying God. They'll be glorifying God that they had a Christian neighbor or a Christian coworker or a Christian friend, or a Christian relative, somebody who both spoke the message to them and lived the message before them. Your actions can change somebody's eternity for good or ill. Your actions can change somebody's eternity. You see, what Peter's challenging us to do is to show the world an alternative to the godless, mindless, immoral, self-centered lifestyles that are so prevalent today. We look around and we hear all the stuff and we see it and we're just shocked and we're amazed and we're saddened by it. What can we do about it? Show them a better way. Do you have any idea how many people just don't know a better way? They just don't. Nobody ever showed them a better way. They don't know that people can actually live a better way. So Peter is calling on us to show them that better way. Show them the better way. He's calling us to live, as James Thompson puts it, to live evangelistically. 
Live evangelistically. Live in a way, such a way that people will be drawn to Christ through the gospel, unhindered by wrong things in our lives, but instead drawn to him by the good and the honorable things that they see in our lives. I want you to notice one last thing in these two verses. Remember who Peter is. He is an apostle of Jesus Christ. He walked and talked with the Savior. He was there on that mountain the day that Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus in what we call the transfiguration. And he was there that day that he heard the voice of God himself say, This is my son. Listen to him. He was with Jesus in Gethsemane. He is the one that Jesus specifically said, Feed my sheep. He's one of the ones to whom Jesus handed the keys of the kingdom of God. But I want you to notice how he speaks to the church. He doesn't command them. He doesn't say, now here's what you got to do. He says, beloved, I urge you. I urge you. King James translation says, I beseech you. It's almost as if he's begging. I'm pleading with you to abstain from the passions of the flesh and to live such godly, noble lives in front of people that they'll see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. That tells us two things. It tells us, first of all, the importance of, of living evangelistically, how necessary it is that we do that. If we don't do it in this world, then we're going to be turning people away from the Lord instead of drawing them to him. This great apostle is, is almost begging his first readers and us as well to live the lives that he has set before us because without it, some who would otherwise be saved would be lost. Some who otherwise would never know their Savior who would have known their Savior, would be lost without him. So it shows the importance of that. But it also shows us that love is a more powerful motivator than authority. He could have spoken authoritatively. He could have given a command. But the impact would be different, wouldn't it? It would be entirely different. And so he beseeches, it. he pleads, he urges, he begs that they will do what he's calling them to do. He's begging, show them a better way. How do you live your life showing a better way? That's what God's calling us to do. Let's bow and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that in your mercy and grace that you allow us to be your children. Not because of anything good within us, Father, but because of the ultimate infinite goodness within you. We thank you for your son, Jesus. And pray that we will live in such a way that we will draw people to him and never, ever turn anyone away. Guide us and bless us, Father, that we will walk through this world as dangerous as it can be in the safety of, of abstaining from the passions of the flesh and of always seeking to do the good, the right, and the honorable. The people will see your son in us. In his name we pray. Amen. If you haven't yet begun to follow Jesus, but you're ready to start, please do so today. Please confess your faith in him that he's God's son and be baptized into him. Have your sins washed away. Start living that life to which he's calling us all. If you're ready to do that, come and tell us while we stand and sing. Take my love.